Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my podcast. I'm Heimo Scheuch, the CEO of Wienerberger, and today I have the pleasure to have with me here at the Wienerberg Tina Gregory from the University in Vienna, and I'm glad to have you here, Tina, and we discuss today the sustainable construction in the urban development. Tina, you have been working at the university for quite a long time. Yes, I have been, uh, but what is imp really important is that I come from practice, and this knowledge from practice inspires and it builds the base for working at the university. And by the way, you are coming from a different cultural background, not an Austrian one. Exactly. Um, so our studio, architectural studio, is based in Ljubljana. Um, it's where it's a city which is very high powered in architecture through Joze Plechnik. So being born then and kind of working in that city, um, you somehow understand an architecture is something that defines the city so powerfully on um, aesthetical ground, social ground, structural ground, material ground, and you carry that with you wherever you work. Today we have a rather strange development. A lot of people are moving to cities for jobs, for education, for development, for culture. But on the other hand, we have cities that suffer from the heat, especially now during the summertime, that suffer from overpopulation, that suffer from a lack of access to affordable housing. So a lot of problems that we really face when we talk about the urban development. What about this? How do you think this development will take us further? Yes, it's uh, different stories are and narratives are in different cities, of course. Um, so the story or the future of Vienna is going to be very different than the future of Paris or the future of Shanghai even. Um, of, there, there, there are different cities and different stages of, let's say, their redevelopment. And let's say Vienna is one of the rare cities which, which is still growing compared to many European cities which are actually shrinking. Um, but it, um, as most of European cities, I think we really neglected the, the problem of urban heat and the scarcity of resources for far too long. So, and now it's the moment where urban design, but also architectural design in, collabor in tight collaboration have to address this through engineering, through smart engineering, and through smart set of also political decisions, because it's, it's a policy to take away, I don't know, 10% of parkings and replace them with trees. Um, and this is not something to discuss. This has became a necessity and we need to somehow address it on so many different levels. I do agree with you. And actually, since more than 200 years, as you know, Wienerberg is working with institutions, with cities in order to develop sustainable housing. And Vienna and uh, Wienerberg are linked to each other for more than 200 years. But surprising, actually, that the in the last two or three decades, this aspect of sustainability has been suffering quite a little bit, especially when it comes to social housing, uh, when it comes also to the aspect of cooling and heating houses. And as you correctly pointed out, the whole system of uh, using and reusing uh, materials. And uh, can we do here something to improve this dialogue between decision makers on one end, you from university, universities and planning and also the political decision makers. Yes, of course, there is a series of um, kind of immediate actions and of course a certain long lasting strategies that should have taken place already. One of them, of course, it's what we know, it's circular design and really very carefully treating everything that is demolished and then segregating them and, and of course reusing for instance, metal bricks and, and the materials at place. But I think before that, we would really need to carefully decide what is truly dismantled and what we truly take away because it's so uh, such an amazing um, energy and effort has been incorporated in those buildings that already stand. And what is um, in relationship to the social housing, I think what is important that in the previous decades, um, in architectural terms, it was far more important to, to build fast and cheap in order to somehow gain the political you know, agendas backwards as soon as possible, but, but was not thought on a long term. So what kind of a construction of social mm. housing 
would have been relevant for the next hundred years in terms of non-artificial cooling, um, in terms of long lasting and in terms of the materials that would really sustain, because a lot of materials which has been used in the previous decades to build social housing, no one knows um, what, what is their future? Are they going completely dissolve in the next decade? And here, actually, I think we should really learn from the 200 years and more, of course, of buildings with bricks in urban uh, environments, because actually those structures, which are more than 100 years old now, are far more sustainable and far more ready for this kind of climate change overheating then they are the newer constructions. So I think we should be able to, to properly analyze um, buildings and learn from what they did before us. So in some things we did advance, mm -hmm. but in others we actually we went back. Very interesting, Tina, what you point out, the sustainability aspect and the material aspect. If I look at certain cities in Europe, like Copenhagen or also in Dutch cities, this aspect, as you call it, facades and the usage of, uh, for example, our brick material in order to keep temperatures down or uh, uh, even green facades and more trees and paving, not asphalt and, and concrete, uh, contributes actively to the climate, the positive climate in cities. Uh, to some extent, I think a um, city like Vienna is lagging a little bit behind, I think, these days, because it's very traditional still in certain aspects when you, do, when you look at the infrastructure planning. Um, I just given an example. In Austria, or it's still in Vienna, you have to create a, a garage spot for a, house, for a new apartment, whereas in Amsterdam or in Copenhagen, nobody talks about the car anymore. It's a bicycle, basically, exactly. and it's nothing to do with cars. Yes, these are these are cultures which they have decades of the of a bike tradition. I also come from a city which mm. is closely to Copenhagen, a bike city, and of course we all learned how much more important and sustainable this is because you have this immediate sustainability, which is actually the quality of the air that the residents are. Uh, inhaling during the uh, their living and working in the city and of course long-term uh, sustainability but this is um, education this is culture first you need to build infrastructure so bike lanes and of course you need to somehow softly force the car out of the spot and not really uh, to the de developers uh, infuse the park to build the parking because th this also kind of very highly um, uh, the, the the price for the apartment becomes far more expensive to be built if it's required to build the garage mm -hmm. and a lot of people are already so aware that they're finding ways how not to have the car so i think we need to we are far more with regulations we are one step behind from the mentality also of Austrians, of Viennese residents, mm. which are very much in tune with the bike culture, especially um, my assistants, let's say, no, no one of them, they have cars, they all bike to school. So I really see in this generation, 30 and 40, they demand the change. They demand the change for their families. Mm. And they, they understand that Vienna could very like swiftly turn into extreme bike and extreme green city just with an adoption of certain very strategic strategies. Yeah. So as you mentioned on the material side with a sort of long lasting and recyclable materials, you can also create a very positive image and a growing city with a better mobility concept and mobility strategy. When you talk about integration, especially from uh, as in cities with a lot of migration, as you have mentioned, uh, for example, with respect to Vienna, also public spaces uh, uh, play a very important role because they are spaces of integration of communication and I think creating those where you have uh, a better climate like water, recycling of water, trees etc would be very helpful I think in a urban uh, development. Yes, certainly of all scales now, because we need to understand the city of a very small pockets of greenery to a really large extensive um, places like, let's say, Prater. But what kind of Vienna, at least from my understanding, lacks its uh, 
the distribution of smaller pieces of greenery on a, a level of kind of two streets together, of micro communities or micro neighborhoods, which is a term that it's in the pr last decades very, very important because before we thought that we need to build big neighborhoods, they need to have big outdoor public spaces. But now it's important that actually you create certain degrees of familiarity. And we need to somehow seek for those opportunities, even if they have 50 square meters or 100 square meters, because on the agenda of the heating of the, the, the city, every square meter counts. Mm. And of course, we, we would need to immediately address the, the issue of the water. Um, and this is quite, uh, which means that we would need to predominantly change the material of flooring for the um, sidewalks, at least if not for the streets, because the sidewalks should in the future slowly collect the water and actually allow the water to be kept in the system, not to be swooshed in five minutes mm. after actually it came down and actually overload our infrastructural system. And again, Tina, that is passionate and one sees your passion about the future development of cities. But we as industry have provided for certain solutions. Yeah? Solutions like collecting, as you say, for the water and not sealing completely exactly. the streets or the pavements, as you call it, but bring the water down, then collect it, clean it and bring it then only to the public sewage systems. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something where we have already a lot of innovation going on mm -hmm. and it would be passionate to use it with colleagues like you in order to create a more affordable a more uh, modern and I would say also a city that it is worth living in. And I think that would be a great future for, for all of us here in Europe, right? Yes, uh, we look forward to these motions. So again, it was a pleasure to have you here, Tina, for this conversation. And you see there's a lot to be done still in European cities to make them a better place for us to live in. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.